Good afternoon, everyone. I can see that we've got a few people who have already joined us for today's uh, longitude session, uh, bench, bedside and beyond. Uh, we'll wait as we have a few more people uh, joining us through the course of the, um, uh, the next few minutes. Uh, very excited. Actually, we've already got over 40 people, so maybe I'll um, start making some introductions and um, uh, start the session off. We've got a really packed agenda today, lots of things to cover, some great research that you'll hear about, and I'd really like to warmly welcome you to this session, um, Bench, Bedside and Beyond, which is our 2022 Lung Transplant Research Presentation. And once again, we're holding this virtually, um, another challenging year with COVID behind us, um, but the virtual sessions also enable us to reach a very wide uh, group of interested parties right across the country. Um, so we're very, very pleased to be here and to be hosting this session again today. Um, my name is Catherine Turkile and I'm one of the Longitude board members um, and I'm representing the board today um, and we'll also be co-hosting this session together with um, Bronwyn Levy, also a board member um, uh, with us today. So many of you will uh, already know a bit about Longitude, but just as people are joining, um, for those of you who are a little bit newer to Longitude, I'd like to share a little bit about what we do um, and why we're so passionate about uh, supporting research and other things that um, help ultimately patients, recipients of lung transplants and their carers and families. So Longitude is an Australian charity, a registered Australian charity that's been focused for a number of years on several things which ultimately help to improve the quality of life of lung transplant recipients um, and, and their carers. Um, we're focused really on four key things. Uh, firstly, research. So really facilitating and funding world-class research, which can make a difference to patients. Secondly, advocacy. So really advocating, being the voice of patients, carers and their family members um, to policy makers, decision makers that may influence um, outcomes for lung transplant patients. Thirdly is support. So really enabling support for uh, lung transplant recipients and, and um, enabling peer-to-peer -peer support as well, which has been a really big part of the work that Longitude has been um, doing over the years. And finally, education, to make sure that people really understand and can get education about lung transplant as well. So those four key things are, are what Longitude is focused on and have been doing um, a lot of tremendous work over the years. Um, and many of you on the call today will have either been part of that support, either financially or your own time, um, or have um, maybe been a recipient of some of that support, or maybe both. Uh, and the work that Longitude does really relies on the tremendous support of many, many people. Um, and we really do want to take this opportunity as well to thank all of you for your involvement, um, either financially or your time. We don't take any of that for granted. Um, and our, our ongoing work relies on every single dollar, every single bit of time that um, this community can, can provide to support the tre tremendous work that's ongoing. So we welcome you if you want to find out more about the work that Longitude does. We've got a lot of information on our website um, and I'm sure any of the board members as well would be happy to provide any more information uh, should you wish to um, find out any more about the work that we do or get involved in some way. And we'll, uh, at the end of this session, remind you of a few of the upcoming things that Longitude has Plan, some exciting things planned, um, which will be fun, but also help us to um, continue to raise funds for this very important cause. So we might move, if we can then, um, Wendy, to the next slide. So just to give you an overview of the next couple of hours, um, we've got some tremendous speakers today, all of whom will be sharing um, an aspect of their research, which is either funded or supported by Longitude in, in some way. Um, this is a little vignette, a little snapshot of what they're doing. The work is very detailed and often very scientific. So they're presenting a snapshot of that today um, to give you some insight into the work that's being supported by Longitude. There will be an opportunity for questions throughout and we encourage you to put your questions. If you can see at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A function. We encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A function. 
because we've got many people on the call, in fact, more than 70 at the moment. So um, we were unable to take the questions uh, verbally. Um, so if you can just put your questions in that Q&A function, and then we'll make sure we get through those questions at the two points at which we'll stop for the Q&As um, through the session today. If we have more questions than we can ha handle um, during the time today, there will be some additional time at the end of the session for those who wish to stay on and we can get to some of those additional questions then. So like I said, it's going to be an action packed um, full session today uh, and really looking forward to hearing um, from our speakers. Um, we will have a poll or a couple of polling questions uh, just to find out a little bit more about where you're joining us from today and your involvement with um, uh, lung transplant. So if um, when they come up, if we could ask you to answer those um, poll questions, that would be very much appreciated as well. So I think with that, I can now um, go to introduce um, my co-host and wonderful board mem member, um, Associate Professor Bronwyn uh, Levy. Now, now most of you will know um, uh, Bronwyn as Bron. Um, either through her tremendous clinical work that she's um, she's done with you or you'll know of her through the other tremendous work that she does through Longitude. But what many of you may not know is that Bron has a, um, a very, very long history and celebrated career, a research and academic career in this space as well. And he's a real leader in, this, in the space of lung transplantation, particularly from the nursing and the, the clinical side. Um, she's been involved in many different um, peak bodies, um, as you can see on our slide there, and is currently the chair of the Victorian and Tasmanian Transplant Advisory Committee and is the national president of the Transplant Nurses Association. And we're very pleased and um, honoured to have her as one of our really critical board members um, and has she has been a board member of Longitude since its foundation in 2016. So, Bron, um, thank you so much for co-hosting with me today. I know um, between us we'll manage the questions that come through, but um, thank you very much for joining us and for introducing our tremendous speakers today. So, um, Bron, actually, sorry, before I um, hand properly to you, I did want to just take a moment to acknowledge our tremendous supporters as well, um, who, as I said before, are absolutely key. Um, we've got many supporters and partners and I'd particularly like to call out the Gillespie Family Foundation, the Giddes family and Mr Tony Pratt, who, without whom we couldn't do the work that we do. Uh, but like I said, we value every single dollar, every single minute that anyone um, donates or, or spends to help us achieve um, the great outcomes that we do um, together with um, um, the research, researchers, etc. So a big thanks to our supporters. And Bron, sorry, back to you. So thanks for joining us. Thanks, Fran, and welcome everyone uh, to this year's uh, Longitude Research Update. So I'm going to um, introduce the uh, first couple of speakers. Our first speaker today is Dr. Sander Stankovic, Stankovic sorry, Sander, um, who is a senior scientist with the Department of Respiratory Medicine at the Alfred now. She actually completed a Bachelor of Science at the University of Auckland and her PhD at the University of Melbourne. And her early research focused on mucosal immunology, um, looking at uh, the context of autoimmunity and virus infections in the lungs. And she looked, has looked specifically at the role of NK cells in anti-cancer immunity. Um, she, is, apart from working with us, is the current member of this uh, scientific program of Transplantation Society of Australia New Zealand and was the convener for the um, uh, uh, meeting this year and uh, uh, in that was held in Adelaide. And uh, our second speaker for today in this second section is uh, Julia Iacono. She's a PhD candidate with the Department of Immunology and Pathology at Monash University, under, working under Professor Ben Marsland uh, from the Central Clinical School and Professor Glenn Westall from the, our lung transplant service at the Alfred. She received a Bachelor of Science with first class honours in respiratory immunology at Monash University in 2019. And she's had a strong interest in looking at the epithelial and immunological processes that underlie the development of pulmonary fibrosis. 
And specifically in her PhD, which we'll talk a little bit about today, she investigates microbes, metabolites, lipids, and gene pathways that underpin the development of chronic lung allograft dysfunction, which many of our transplant patients know all about. Um, and her research is looking uh, at molecular signals with the potential for it to be used as prognostic and therapeutic biomarkers in clinical practice. So without further ado, I might head on to our first speaker, Dr. Sander Stankovic. Thanks, Sander. Thank you, Bronwyn. All right, so I will um, spend the next 10 minutes, and please tell me if I'm over time, just telling, um, I guess, talking a little bit about um, what it is we do, but largely there will be a big chunk of my talk sort of saying why we do what we do and what are some of the challenges we face in the research that comes in the context of lung transplantation. Um, so we are part of the Alfred, but you will find us in a Burnett uh, building. So Glenn, I'm sure you all know, um, Jade works on uh, primary fibrosis, so she's not involved in this work, but alongside uh, what I do, a huge um, shout out to Ellie, who does um, a lot of work in the transplant community. So really it's two of us. Lucy was part of us, and then she went on to run Red Cross, so I guess it's lifeblood um, now in Adelaide, so she's still very much involved uh, in what we do, but not physically <laughs> present. All right, so one of the um, major uh, things when it comes to immune system is that immune system is very good at um, attacking, targeting anything dissimilar uh, to itself. And it does this via receptors, so if you like antennas that are present on the cell surface. So good examples are infections and cancer, right? So if we watch this little movie and we'll look at green little dudes that are immune cells and cancer cells is an example because cancer cells are dissimilar to our cells and our immune system can um, identify that. Um, if you follow this little dude here and the big cancer cell here, you'll see how efficient they are at recognising, targeting and destroying um, uh, anything that looks like it's not itself. So, and this is live, so it takes, it's this quick. Um, and then if we watch this for a bit longer, there's a bit of a carnage going on, um, but I think you get the idea. And that is that immune system is great at what it does. Um, and it does this largely by um, recognizing um, other cells uh, through what are known as HLA receptors and cell surface. And there'll be quite a bit of talk, I think, later on today about HLA, so I thought I'd introduce it. HLA, again, antennas and cell surface, and each individual has a slightly different, I guess, variation of the HLAs. And you'll often hear, you know, terminology of HLA matching. And that is because, you know, if we look at John's cells and we look at Mary's cells, um, they are likely to have very different HLAs and cell surface. So Mary's cells or Mary's immune system will recognise John's cells as potentially foreign. It won't recognise it. So that it won't make necessarily a huge distinction between John's cells and an infection. Um, and HLA is very important because it is not only one of the most diverse um, receptors or antennas on cell surface, and it is used by immune system to report the health um, uh, of any given cell, such as infection and cancer. But in, in transplantation in particular, uh, it becomes a bit of a problem because donor cells uh, express HLA that is recognised as foreign by the recipient's immune system. Um, and then um, the problem that we face in transplantation is that donor lung is seen as potentially foreign immune scenario. So that's sort of the scenario we're faced with. Um, to combat this, we um, use immunosuppression um, and um, th that does a great job of dampening the immune system. However, it does, uh, it does have consequences, and that is that now we have a dampened immune system that cannot address, um, you know, infections such as viral infections very well, and cytomegalovirus is one of the mo more problematic viruses uh, when it comes to transplant settings. So I will touch a little bit on that um, today as well. Another thing that happens is that immunosuppression tries to walk this fine line between enough and not too much, 
Um, so there is also um, rejection that can take place. And I will talk about rejection specifically um, CLAD, and that's the chronic uh, rejection that happens over a long uh, period of time, often after first year post-transplant. So now we have these sort of, um, you know, issues where we have immunosuppression that causes viral reactivation, um, but we also have rejection. And this is really what we try to combat, which is how to stop the attack by the recipient's immune system and how to prevent or reduce infections in the transplant setting. And our research approach, um, I guess to break it down to uh, how we address it at least, is um, we have what we know about healthy lung immunology. And we use that as our sort of basis, as our sort of gold standard, I guess, of how things should be. Uh, and we extrapolate our understanding of what happens in the transplant setting based on that. We also identify changes that take place post-transplant in the lung and try to correlate these changes uh, with clinical outcomes. So I will show you some of the data that we have generated uh, doing exactly this. Um, so one of the things we were uh, initially interested in and, and still are is, is what happens to, um, I guess, the immune system that comes across with the donor lung. So often this is not talked about, but um, lung actually contains a lot of uh, immune cells that are there to maintain itself. So they do have a job of antiviral responses, they make the epithelial cells happy. So we often, um, and over the years, I guess it has come up, uh, you know, in various sort of research contexts, but uh, we really wanted to look in, in a much greater detail as to what actually happens to these immune cells, what we call passenger lymphocytes, after transplantation. So just to sort of demonstrate, I guess, in a sort of little diagram is that if this is donor lung and these are the donor cells, immune cells that make the lung, I guess, function um, well. Um, after, the, after he goes into the recipient, what happens to these green cells? We know, and, and you know, what happens to the recipient cells as they come in? Are they the same? Do they both do the same job and so on? Um, and how does the composition of the immune cells in the lung change after the transplantation? Um, and so um, one of the things that um, we have access to, and uh, the technology is great actually these days, is because um, we do have the tools that allow us to um, analyze donor cells independently from the recipient cells. We can also identify the type, the characteristics, the, the you know, how well they are proliferating uh, within the lung. We can tell a lot um, by uh, doing the analysis. And uh, of course, um, the lung lavage fluid um, that um, probably transplant recipients are quite um, familiar with is that um, that fluid contains a lot of information that we then use to um, analyze um, at our end. So they contain a lot of immune cells and they contain a lot of uh, immune mediators. So as the lung lavage fluid is collected over the course of course, transplant period, so usually starting about two weeks to about um, 12 months post-transplant, or it um, goes on a bit beyond that, uh, we can then use this data to then correlate it with clinical outcomes. So we can correlate it with, for example, CLAD development uh, that happens much later, um, often um, beyond this, that sort of um, two weeks to 12 month period. So, okay, this is the first sort of data slide that I will show. And that is purely to sort of demonstrate um, basically what we can do. So this is just, uh, and this just runs through a machine that's called flow cytometer. And we put labels uh, on the cells that identify donor cells and the recipient cells. And we can see that uh, in this particular bowel sample that was collected at three months, a lot of the donor uh, immune cells are still present in the lung because lung lavage or BAL um, demonstrates, I guess, what's present in the lung. Mm -hmm. What we can also do is compare this to the blood and we can see that these cells are very specific. They don't really circulate around the blood much. They really stick to the, uh, uh, to the lung. So they're resident in the lung um, and our question was, what do they do? Are they correlated? You know, if they persist for a long time, are they correlated with better or worse, or worse uh, lung health? So in the next slide, I'll just show you a, a percentages that basically just look at, you know, here the donor cells were 90% and recipients were 8%. So I'll just show you percentages of donor cells over time um, 
from uh, bowel fluids from two weeks to about, I think, 12 or 18 months post-transplant. Now, this is pooled from a lot of patients, and this is also stratified based on the individuals that have developed CLAD in the first three years post-transplant versus those that have not. Uh, and I will also show you some data that relates to the virus or CMV infection. And basically what we see, so if we, if we um, enumerate the percentages of the cells in the lavage fluid, we can see that in the individuals that do not go on to develop CLAD, and this is just showing, you know, two weeks, six weeks, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, and 18 months post-transplant, uh, when we tally all the numbers up, we can see that the group that does not develop CLAD in the first uh, three years post-transplant actually has quite a lot of um, donor-derived cells that persist in the lung. We can then say that this um, uh, increased presence is correlated with protection from CLAD. Um, and then we do extra work on the side to identify, to characterize, to, to figure out uh, what this really means mechanistically. We can then do the same so use the same data sets, but instead of looking at CLAD and looking at the slightly sort of more um, specific part of the lung, which is the lung epithelium, we can see, um, we can then correlate this with, for example, um, incidence of CMV infection uh, or CMV being the virus that's quite common post-transplant. And we can see that similarly, again, the individuals that um, seem to be protected against CMV, even though they are CMV positive, um, they seem to have this persistence of donor-derived immune cells in the lung epithelium. So our question has now been, is, is this a cause or if, uh, you know, just the outcome of um, sort of a, a weaker anti-graft response? Do these cells do something? Do they, are they protective? And how do they protect the lung? Um, in addition to this, what we can also do is that we can look at the, um, the cytokines or the, the immune mediators. So these are the things that immune cells secrete. Uh, they produce and they have great effects overall because they can attract other immune cells. They, they really cause um, you know, quite a bit of inflammation, I guess, in the, in the uh, lung itself. So we can measure these, again, from the lavage fluid and actually look again, um, same way, look at the individuals that do develop um, chronic uh, rejection of the lung and those that don't. And then correlate, you know, is there something that goes on uh, and at which point post-transplant do these things happen um, that actually uh, give rise to CLAD later on? And this is what we found. So I I'm not necessarily saying what the mediator was. Uh, I guess for this purposes, it's important just to say that it's the mediator uh, of inflammation. And we can also see that not all, as if, again, if we stratify individuals into those that will develop bad and those that will not, what we find is that there is a statistically uh, significant increase in this inflammatory mediator um, secretion in the lung uh, of the individual individuals that will develop CLAD and as early as two weeks post-transplant. Not in everyone, but the fact that there is some differential amount suggests that there is something about inflammation in the lungs early on post-transplant that may contribute to CLAD development. Um, so again, we use this as a basis of then uh, pursuing further the why and the how. Um, and yeah, this is pretty much what I said, that it seems that something early on um, it is already setting the scene for long-term um, lung health. Um, and so just to summarize quickly, um, hopefully I've sort of demonstrated some, some of what we do. I mean, this is clearly, you know, short snippets, but we try to, our work tries to identify the cell types that are involved in post-transplant clinical outcomes. We try to identify mechanism of how the lung immune cells actually regulate long-term health. And then potentially uh, what our work also does, and ultimately this is, I guess, the aim, is to, it provides targets for future potential cellular therapies to both um, enhance lung health in, in against re rejection and also against um, virus infections. Um, I will stop here because I may have gone over time already and I will hand it back to you, Bronwyn. Thanks very much, Sandra, for that great introductory sli slides and talk. Um, I think we'll move straight on to Julia's talk. And then just remember everyone, if you've got any questions, please use the Q&A function in the bottom of the uh, presentation view there. Thanks, Julia, over to you.
Thanks, Bron. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for having me uh, share some of the results from my PhD today. Um, so I'd really like to open today's talk with uh, actually just a snapshot of where um, this project started back in 2019. Um, this is a picture of my supervisor at Longitude presentation for 2019, and he was explaining at the time uh, where they were at and what, what the project would look like and the direction that the future study would, look, would go into. And he was explaining that um, by collecting large amounts of data from lung transplant patients, including from bacteria resident in the lungs, uh, it could help us understand uh, better the patient trajectory post-transplant and how CLAD would develop. And actually, little did I know at the time, I was still completing my honors, that this would then become my PhD project. So today I will essentially be continuing on from, what his talk, from his talk and presenting some of the initial outcomes from this study. So why look at bacteria? Um, I think everyone these days has become more conscious that at any given time, we are home to over 100 trillion microbes and that whether we like it or not, they inhabit our gut, our skin, and even our lungs. And 100 trillion is in fact much more than the number of human cells in our body. And it sounds a little scary, but over time, we've actually started to learn that in fact, these bugs, uh, which we collectively call the microbiome, do play a beneficial role for health and that we need them in order to have a functioning immune system. And that as a consequence, our human body is much more like an ecosystem where our human and microbial cells then interact. So we know a lot about the gut, but what we're, we, what we're only beginning to explore now is what their role is in the lungs. And this has been thanks to the development of more sensitive technologies that enabled us to measure and detect microbes that um, compared to the gut, for example, are present in much lower quantities. And so thanks to this, we came to understand that the healthy lungs, even in the absence of infection, are colonized with microbial species that divide into a balanced community. This also can include fungi and viruses, and they collectively then form the microbiome. However, during infection, some, of, some microbial species can take over and destabilize this community that was previously balanced. So we understand that microbes are important to health, but how much do we understand about what happens to this microbiome after transplantation and how can we best collect this kind of information from the lung lavages that are performed at the Alfred and which many of you are familiar with. This is why uh, we have developed a workflow in our lab that allows us to isolate the, and study the bacteria and fungi in the transplanted lungs, as well as looking at other things, uh, which I will discuss a bit later, um, and looking at the activity of the, our human cells from the lungs. And this is done in our lab by separating the lung lavage that is collected during a bronchoscopy into main, three main fractions that are then processed separately using the most optimal conditions for the type of analysis that we want to perform. So what happens to the microbiome after the transplant? What we saw was that if we take all of the lung lavages collected and we align them uh, over time post-transplant, many good bacterial species associated with health become more abundant. You can see here that there is a trend that incre increases. We also see that many pathogenic species actually go away, so they, they decline, which really suggested to us that after a transplant, the lung microbiome is really quite dynamic and that over time it slowly returns to health after the transplant. So with this kind of information, we can start looking at how different species interact with each other after the transplant. And we do this by drawing these community structures. So here, um, every circle is a microbe with bacteria in this green and blue color, and fungi are here in purple. And each line shows whether they interact. And what you can see here is that at the very beginning of the transplant, during the first six weeks, there is not much interaction. So there are not many lines connecting bacteria either to another bacteria or bacteria to a fungi in purple. But over time, 
what we see is that bacteria and fungi learn to become friends and form a very densely connected community. And among this, we are beginning to understand which species are the most important to this, the stability of this uh, microbiome. And I have more data now to suggest that fungi and bacteria actually help each other make their respective communities uh, stronger. So I think this will be relevant when we consider that many patients are administered antibiotics or antifungals. So hopefully this can help us understand the effect of those um, uh, drugs on whether and uh, whether they would end up wiping out some of these really important species that are key to the stability of the microbiome. So we're starting to get a sense for how the microbiome behaves post-transplant. And so changing focus on the other side of the ecosystem, the human cells of the transplanted lungs, we were really interested in understanding how the lung talks to the rest of the body and how does it signal that something is not right, and particularly when it comes to CLAD. So when CLAD starts, what we see is that the patient's lung starts, uh, lung function starts to decline and results in, and this results then in the need for another transplant. So our main question was, based on the information that we can collect here through the uh, bronchoscopies taken, is there something that will inform us that this decline will take place in the near future? So more, um, in other words, is there a signal that we can detect early before, before the lung function starts to decline and deteriorate so that we can potentially adjust the ongoing therapy and slow down uh, the decline that comes afterwards? And for this purpose, we looked at the activity of the human cells, which when activated during uh, injury or infection, if something is happening here, they produce these um, uh, chemicals and, and molecules uh, that signal, uh, that can act as messengers to relay uh, that, that something is happening, that there is a, a problem. And so it's a little bit like a relay race where every cell is exchanging this, this message. So the main question here was, um, are these cells activated? Are they producing these um, uh, signals? And uh, very much in line with what Sanda was just explaining, um, the answer is yes. And so what we found was that cells from patients that develop CLAD are much more active when compared with cells uh, from patients who do not develop CLAD, signaling uh, more inflammation and activated immune system. And uh, exactly as what Sanda was, was explaining, uh, this is actually happening during the first year post-transplant and before CLAD has even occurred. In fact, if you compare the lung function from the two groups, you can see that the trend line is going up. So the lung function is increasing post-transplant. However, despite having the same trend, CLAD patients are already showing uh, these uh, signals, which correspond to increased inflammation. So the next question was, how can we use this information to um, infer on the patient trajectory? How can we predict what will happen based on the information we can collect here? And so one of the hardest things about CLAD, and I'm sure you're all familiar with, is that there is no way to predict whether and when CLAD will occur. So this is where, with the help of big computers, we can use all of the information we have collected to understand how uh, at risk of developing CLAD a patient is. And I will uh, briefly explain how this works. So very simple, we teach the computer that samples from CLAD patients have a lot of activated cells. And we then put the computer to the test and we show it, we show it new samples and we ask, based on the activated cells, which samples belong to patients that are most likely to develop CLAD. And this is what the result looked like. So far, the computer was able to um, correctly identify 21 samples that uh, as coming uh, from CLAD-free patients and 11 as coming from CLAD patients. So just to remind you, these samples were taken before a CLAD diagnosis. So this what this means is that this model is able to correctly predict whether a patient is at high risk for developing CLAD. So this, I think, is really exciting 
Um, there is just a catch that it also misclassified uh, nine of these samples with the wrong diagnosis. So we're working now to improve these results further so that we have a model that is much more accurate and that we can rely on. And we hope that this can be used in the future in the clinic so that we can start scoring patients that are at high risk of developing CLAD and potentially adjust their therapy early. So to briefly summarize, uh, microbes and activated cells can help us understand how the transplanted lungs behaves post-transplant and what the signals are for health and CLAD. And we can use large computers to help us understand which features of what we found are most important to uh, understand whether the patient is going to develop CLAD or not. And ultimately, this helps us understand how the patient trajectory could be and whether they are moving away or towards CLAD over time, um, and potentially to do, being able to do this before the lung function has started to decline so that they can be, um, uh, uh, they can be um, given uh, the right medication before the lung function becomes um, to, starts to deteriorate. And I'd just like to thank everyone that supported me with this project, uh, my supervisors and everyone in the lung transplant research team, um, all the research nurses and the patients that um, kindly donated uh, their lavage for us. And thank you, thank to all of you for your attention. Thank you so much, Julia. That was a great talk as well, and it followed on very well from Sanders. Um, and I, we've got a little bit of time set aside now for just some questions. And I think I might, uh, uh, there's one in the um, uh, chat here from one of, one of our patients, actually, who's asked, uh, akin to fecal transplants that reorient the uh, colonic or the bowel microbiome, maybe a inhaled cocktail of healthy bacteria and fungi could be useful to restore the lung microbiome health. What are your thoughts about that, Julia? Yeah, I think that's that's something that I find really exciting. It's a really good question. And it's uh, sort of really follows on on what, what the results are and what, what the potential is um, to harness the microbiome for health. Um, I think they've done this uh, for the gut so they can do fecal microbial transplant uh, to help with certain diseases. Um, for the lung, I think there is uh, much more research. It's sort of an uh, emerging field. So uh, there isn't as much research that can uh, uh, sort of um, uh, justify this approach yet. So we're really, um, we're actually moving uh, towards uh, using uh, what these bugs are producing as a supplement to, instead of using the bug, uh, rather use this, uh, what they produce um, to uh, improve health in the lungs. Yeah. Thanks very much, Julia. Um, so another uh, uh, attendee has asked, does the risk of getting clad increase or reduce for long-term survivors? So I think um, maybe uh, I might throw that to Sander. What is it? Oh, I was going to throw it to a clinician. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, I could, I would, we know that actually the longer patients survive, the risk of getting chronic lung ulcer graft dysfunction increases um, and that is of course one of the the main things that we're always working towards trying to prevent and uh, uh, over over the life of of uh, a transplant recipient lung transplant recipient so um, but uh, yeah I think that that the information you two have shown so far is you know trying to get on top of the process early is really important and and trying to identify which patients are more at risk there's another question here that someone's asked, how does plasma infusions and treat, treatment relate to CLAD? So I'm just wondering whether I've got uh, one of uh, uh, the Greg or Glenn who are on um, could answer that in the light. I don't know if they want to answer it live or answer it on typing, that might be easier. So Catherine, do you think we should move on to I think if if one of them can come off mute and want to answer live, that would be even better. Uh, yeah, we've Greg, probably got a minute or two. Greg said he would like to answer this question live. So, <laughs> Professor Greg <laughs> Snell, would you like to? He's show? also typing an answer to the other question. <laughs> oh. <laughs> at the same time, multitasking. <laughs> multitasking. <laughs> so, 
I don't know whether he's that. Uh, oh, we've got the poll questions. Okay. But can I um, answer the, yes. um, the infusion uh, question? I think is something that's a really important uh, thing. The infusions of, of uh, intravenous gamma globulin are essentially safe. They are part of the normal immune system anyway, and they can block antibodies. So that could be good against rejection and could be good against infection. And indeed, there's a small pilot study being completed um, here at the Alfred to look at that specifically. And um, Glenn is going to be analysing the the big those big questions with the hope that we can. Um, convince the um, Red Cross, uh, sorry, the, the CSL group to go on and do a bigger study of whether everyone should get IVIG um, after a transplant. So it's it's uh, something that is aimed at reducing troubles after a transplant and, and the, the definitive study might yet be done at the Alfred. Um, the, the other question about the, um, uh, the risk of uh, clad in long-term survivors, in some ways, if you clad coming on early it suggests a more risk immune system and tends to be more trouble. Um, a drift in lung function later, and particularly after sort of eight, 10 years, tends to be not quite as, as much trouble, but each person's their own unique experiment of science between you know, the, the medicines, the, the bugs and um, viruses and, and you know, some of the pre-programmed things with the transplant. Thanks, Greg. Um, I've got, there's one other question that I might get you to answer, or actually um, it could be for any of the, either of the researchers too. Have, have, have you codified or formalized the CLAD subtypes, e.g. BOSS? So there's different, we know there's different types of, of CLAD. Um, and, and maybe that's, I don't know, Julia and Sandra, from your point of view, Julia? Yeah, I was going to comment. So uh, in this case, for my study, um, essentially all the patients had BOSS. So I wasn't that's, able that's to... That, yeah, that's a bit of a problem. That yeah. BOSS is the most common. So you only get a very few kind of, you know, RAS, for example, and it's you really can't, can't compare necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We would love to uh, look at the differences between BOSS and RAS, but because RAS is so uh, uncommon, uh, it's really difficult to do. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, we might um, move on, I think. Um, and just just uh, just jumping in so uh, hopefully everyone saw uh, as Bron mentioned the poll jump up on the screen if you if you could just answer that quickly it's just three quick questions and then um then we can uh, report that back to all of the attendees i just wanted to also call out i know there are a couple of questions from marybeth so just a big thanks and acknowledgement marybeth for your, um uh, joining today great great to see you join the call um and Hopefully we've addressed your question on the funding, but absolutely happy to have a separate chat with you. And I see that you've also raised a question there just with regard to providing sampling for research. So that might be a separate question that um, Bron and the team can get back to you on um, just separately, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so, so hopefully, I don't know, Wendy, where we're up to with the polling, um, we might be close to being able to show some figures or maybe at the end of the call, we can share with you where people have joined us from today. And maybe we can hand to, I think we're handing to um, Gordon and Greg Bron, I think, briefly. Yeah, I'll just start load up uh, Gordon so he can come on the screen and yeah, we can share the answers to the poll later as well. Great, thanks, Wendy. So as Gordon comes up, just a big thanks to our first um, couple of speakers. I think it was acknowledged in the Q&A there that there's some excellent research being done and. Um, a great simplification of that research for the purposes of today. So a big thanks uh, to Sandra and Julia for presenting today. Gordon and Greg, I think we've got a bit of a presentation. Maybe we need a drum roll or something here. Um, Gordon? Um, before I start, I just want to say um, a big thank you to Wendy, Bronwyn and Catherine for putting all this together because um, it just wouldn't happen without you three. So um, thank you for all the hard work. There's so much that goes on the back. Um, of this um, so thank you so much for that also for um, to the researchers as well because every single year we do this um, I get to understand a lot more what's happening I think when we first did this it was all very technical language and I couldn't understand a lot was going on so thank you for that so I have the pleasure very simple task to provide a check for one hundred and thirty five thousand dollars to the Alfred and if this goes well Greg should be able to get this virtually so Greg you should be able to pick that up 
Oh, there, there we go. Yeah, I've, there we go. That's better. <laughs> so thank you there. so much. So it's a pleasure to give you one hundred thirty-five thousand dollars, which, um, as someone said, goes towards the towards the research because, um, you know, this research wouldn't happen without our funding and without all the donors. So, so thank you so much for all the work you do. Gordon um, and Wendy and uh, Longitude and all the supporters, uh, you know, the Alfred team thanks you very much and. Uh, um, and we really love to be able to put back in and make change for, for you guys for the and for all the other people around and we try very hard and um, and to complete things and, and get it out into the world as you'll hear. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Gordon and Glenn. Great technology. It's better than the checks in the mail. Right? <laughs> and, uh, the virtual checks. So well done. So big thanks.